Thank you, Kenneth. I am so happy that you have joined us. Let's give him another hand. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Alice Reed, and I'm the spiritual director here, and I'm um, so happy to see so many beautiful faces here. Man, we're going to have to get some more chairs. Yeah, yeah. Let me just start with a, just a brief announcement. I know many of you know that um, we uh, lost a member suddenly, uh, Dina Van Slyke. Uh, we are looking towards doing a memorial for her, but Lee is still recovering from the accident, so it'll, it'll be, a, you know, he'll be in the hospital in another couple weeks, so uh, we'll keep you informed on our newsletter, and there'll be some links for more information if you'd like, uh, but Lee is recovering, so I'll share that with you because I know that's on the tip of a lot of our hearts. Uh, phew, another thing to... Um, to, to talk to you about is our um, Orange County's Got Talent. <laughs> We're gonna, on August 4th, there's an opportunity for us to really showcase our passions and our talents, some fun. I'm gonna do a fun little com comedic skit. Um, <laughs> if you've got some, some hidden talent that you wanna share with us, August 4th is the time to do that, and you can sign up at the kiosk. I know, for instance, my friend John, who's here, plays the sax. Maybe you want to come play the sax for us. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities. Maybe a couple of you want to get together and, and do a skit. Or um, when I was in Bali recently, we did what we called Bali Palooza. <laughs> so at the final night of our trip, everybody came together, and there were people who lip-synced and danced to a song. It's really about coming together and sharing fun and community with each other. So I hope you'll consider signing up for that. And, and that is uh, living out loud. That is what our theme is for the years, living out loud. So I'm gonna encourage you to live out loud on August 4th and join us for that. Um, I guess there's one final thing I wanna share with you. If you didn't know it, our youth program is making its way back. And so we always have someone here available for childcare. There's a lesson. If these principles are meaningful for you, bring your kids, bring your grandkids. It's an opportunity to help ground them in a philosophy that really is an amazing way to uh, ground our youth in this world of ours that is uh, always changing. There's a lot, a lot of changes going on. I keep looking around and I look at what's going on in the, in the media and what's going on in the world and, and it's, it's, we're still sort of landing on our feet and people are deciding who they are and where they want to work and where they want to live now that um, we spent a couple of years in uh, lockdown. We have a lot more freedom, it seems, or we're taking that freedom. Um, and so as we look at this idea of living out loud all year, this month's theme is speaking truth to circumstance. And that is a play on words from, and uh, maybe you've heard it, speak truth to power. And that was first used by the Quakers who were coining that phrase, speak truth to power, because in the mid-1950s, there was a call to the United States to stand firm against fascism and other forms of total, total <laughs> Too many syllables, oh my goodness. <laughs> Totalitarianism. Uh, now, before you get concerned, this is not going to be a political talk. We're not going to be talking about politics all all month when we look at this idea of speaking truth to circumstance, but we are going to be looking at our relationship to power. I want you to consider that there's a very real difference about having power over something versus having power with something. You see the subtle difference that there? When, you know, in this world that we live in that's busy and a little bit competitive and everybody's trying to get ahead and get theirs and take care of themselves in this busy world, oftentimes we can get kind of sucked up into this idea of having power over things, power over people, power over circumstances, power over your eight-year-old grandson, uh, <laughs> which I want to tell you is a lost cause. <laughs> yeah, but, 
But when we shift our lens a little bit and begin to look at what it means to be in power with something, then we're allowing ourselves to elevate our gaze a little bit to begin to see that there's a power in the universe. Some of you know this and can almost say it with me, greater than you and you can use it. And also, there's a power for good in the universe greater than you and it can use you. And so when we begin to look at this idea of having power with the universe, it empowers us to begin to understand that there's power in our choices. There's power in the things we do. There's power in the way we relate to one another. There's power in the way that we experience the circumstances of our lives and the lives around us. And so as we look at this idea of speaking um, power to, or sorry, speaking truth to circumstance, I want to begin to help us understand that we're working with, uh, I think the, my favorite name for God or spirit is the thing that makes the grass grow. And I like that because it's neutral. It doesn't, I don't feel like it triggers anybody, <laughs> you know. Some of us, some of us come to the spiritual path with a, with a little bit of baggage sometimes. Sometimes we've, so, you know, they, uh, there's a couple people I have met, just a few, <laughs> <laughs> that don't have any baggage when it comes to this idea of a power greater than ourselves. And so when we think about that there is a power in the universe that makes the grass grow, that changes the season, that causes the earth to rotate around the sun, that causes the stars to hang in the sky in the place that they do, and, and that everything thing seems to work in concert with each other. There's like this integration in the world around us, the natural world. And then we humans come along and we muck it up. <laughs> and sometimes we make it more beautiful, right? You know, sometimes we make the world a better place to live. I, um, and so as I was looking at this topic today, I was thinking about the difference between walking out life from, a, I'll call it an egoic perspective, where I'm looking at everything around me as outside of myself, as othering people, as othering circumstances, of not really feeling connected with the world around me, versus being in tune with the natural world that I am naturally part of and that I am here to elevate and enhance. And I set, use I in the universal sense because each one of us has been imbued with a beautiful creative power to lift our own lives and the lives around us. And so we look at this idea of having power with, it allows us to see the world through a different lens. And maybe to respond to the world a little differently from a more elevated place. To begin to understand that we too have a place in the natural order of things. But I don't know about you, I get a little caught up. <laughs> I get caught up in the, the, the events of the world. I get caught up in the points of views that are very different from mine. I get caught up in, um, do you ever get a sense that there's just things that need fixing? <laughs> You know, there's just things I need to repair. I have come to understand that when that comes up in me, when I feel like I have to fix something or repair something, you know, I'm not talking about your broken transmission, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and even that, there's somebody, there's help for those kind of things. I'm, I'm really talking about the situations that we feel like we have to make right. Sometimes, situations come up to open us up and wake us up. Um, there's a wonderful book, and I'd be very surprised if you've never heard of it, called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And in that book, he talks about how humanity has been domesticated to begin to 
uh, look towards the culture or the environment for the cues for who we should be and how we should live in the world. And his point in saying that is that it, we really need to wake up. We need to be awake and aware and available. And um, when we allow ourselves to be, I'll use the term, enculturated, it's like going to sleep. But then we have these experiences, right? They're the, the little blips in life that tend to wake us up. The recent uh, car accident with Lee and Dina, boy, that woke me up. I was, I felt um, like just on edge when that happened. And certainly, you know, I imagine that you all have situations that'll, that'll wake you up. But the trick is to not allow them to of course, we're going to have our feelings. So I'm not ex suggesting at all that you deny your feelings, but I am suggesting that you allow your feelings to complete themselves and be present with the circumstances. And at the same time, ask yourself and ask that higher wisdom self, that thing that makes the grass grow, what else is there for me to know right now? When we have strong emotions, when we get triggered by things, it's an opportunity for us to maybe do some clearing. The thing I really love about this philosophy, the thing that attracted me to it, to the depths that I dropped a career as an accountant and became a minister full time, the thing that really attracted me to it was transparency. That the, the principles and the practices of this philosophy create an ability for me and give me the tools to be transparent and to have clear thinking. And so when little episodes come up, it's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to see what wants to be cleared. I am um, reminded of the, uh, the story of Arjuna. Arjuna is the main character in a beautiful sacred Hindu text called the Bhagavad Gita. And in that story, in that narrative, Ar Prince Arjuna is forced to follow what he thinks is his dharma, and dharma is just your life path. And he thinks his life path is to be a warrior. He thinks his life path is to be in battle. And he's at odds with this. So, it, something's not gelling for him. It doesn't, something's not making sense to him. And, and in the story, Krishna, who turns out to be uh, disguised as his chari chariot driver, Krishna and Arjuna ha begin to have this dialogue. And Krishna, slowly and gently, and sometimes a little more abruptly, <laughs> begins to help Arjuna wake up begins to help him see the bigger picture, begins to help him take his eyes off the battleground, if you will, so that he could begin to understand this beautiful rhythm of life that he's living in. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful analogy of the, um, do, do we still call it the rat race? <laughs> <You know? laughs> It's a beautiful analogy of the rat race and how we have to do, sometimes feel like we have to do battle against the odds of trying to make ends meet and bringing things together when the truth is sometimes there's perfection in what we deem broken. And sometimes the things that, the circumstances, the, the things that are happening around us are calling us to a greater truth. I loved your song about the, you know, the things are calling, that's your calling. And I want to say that, that that broken romance, that lost job, that difficulty with your finances, that that is life calling you to a higher elevation of awareness and availability. I want to share with you a story well, no, first, I want to tell you about <laughs> the spiritual tools that, um, that we have available to us when we find ourselves getting caught up. The first tool is meditation. Meditation is an opportunity for us to 
to allow things to settle down, to get quiet, to begin to um, uh, retract our thinking and our mind and our focus from the busyness of life just for a few minutes. We do that beautiful two minutes of silence and it's the opportunity for us to pause and two minutes is powerful. If you can't do 20 minutes of meditation, do two. It's that pause that we can take to give us enough of a higher level of vision, vision if you will, to whatever the circumstance is, to uh, pause our emotions, to pause the triggers so that we can be present and speak truth to circumstance. We do meditation here on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. You're welcome to join us. It's just 15 minutes. On Wednesday nights, uh, the, the, we don't, we take off the fifth Wednesdays, but um, on regular Wednesdays, we do a meditation practice. I do two of those meditations, uh, practices uh, on Wednesdays, and we have another gentleman, Christian Steele, who uses a different modality of uh, meditation. And so the, if you're curious about meditation, there's also lots of different resources. And um, if you're a meditator, um, keep it up. <laughs> keep it up, because it really is like a detox for our mind. The other spiritual tool is that I want to highlight this morning is compassionate listening. And compassionate listening is when you listen to someone and let go of your own ideas and responses that you might want to make as they are sharing with you. And that can be pretty easy when it's somebody you love. And it's not so easy when it's somebody who has a, maybe a different point of view than you do. And so I want to share a story with you about a gentleman who started an organization called the Urban Confessional. And the Urban Confessional is now I know confession might pull some triggers for you, but really it's an opportunity for his organization. They set up tables in public areas with a sign that says free listening. And they're just there to listen. Just there to listen. And so there's a particular, I first found out about this organization, gosh, I guess it was seven or eight years ago, and I, and I read this story and I want to share it with you. And I, and I want to share it with you in his words because it's a powerful story about setting up a free listening table outside of the Republic National Convention in Cleveland in 2016. There was a, that was a very interesting year, 2016. And so he writes, she was just staring at me she had something to say, and I could tell she was curious about the free listening sign, but she didn't seem to have the courage to speak to me. Yet, I knew there was a yet, so I waited. Nowhere to be and all day to get there, and it was so hot outside. Finally, she walked up, and like a young warrior preparing for battle, she said, I don't usually do this. And I know this isn't a hot button topic anymore, but I think abortion is wrong. It's not a form of birth control and people who have them should be arrested for murder. Most of the protesters of the, at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland were yelling about Donald Trump for or against all part of this beautiful circus of free speech, but she was different. There was no circus here. She was serious. I had the free listening sign up at the convention for a few hours, and most people spoke with me, told me about their families, their jobs, and the things that brought them to Cleveland. No one had opened up about a serious but controversial issue yet. But here she was. So I said to her, Will you tell me your story? I'd love to know how you came to this point of view. As she spoke to me about her beliefs on abortion, I wanted to stop her and tell her my story. I had sat with two loved ones as they suffered through the difficult decision and consequences of ending a pregnancy. It was a brutal human experience and gave me insight 
to something I had never witnessed before. In moments like that, choice doesn't seem to be the right word. So when she told me they should be arrested for terminating a pregnancy, the familiar burn of disagreement started to fire in me. There were so many things I wanted to say. I wanted to change her mind, to argue, to disagree. It's a natural response. But if my story brought me to my beliefs, then I needed to know how her story brought her to her beliefs. So I asked, thank you for sharing that. Tell me your story. I'd love to know how you came to this point of view. She seemed surprised by my interest. Why? It doesn't matter. Your sign said free listening, so I gave you something to listen to. <laughs> Give me more to listen to, he said. They should be locked up. It's wrong. It's not right to go out and sleep with whoever and just vacuum away the results like it never happened. She paused, then inhaled the entire world. And it's not fair. All I ever wanted was to be a mom. My whole life, I knew I was meant to have children. And then when I was 18, 18, the doctor told me I'd never have children. My ovaries were damaged or missing. It doesn't matter which. I kept it a secret. And when my husband found out, he left me. I'm alone. My body doesn't work. I'm old. Who will ever love me? I wondered if she could hear my heart breaking. So I guess I get upset when I see people who can get pregnant, who have kids, whose bodies work, who can be moms, and they just choose not to. Sometimes there's nothing to disagree with. I didn't need to be right. I just needed to be there. She wiped away a few tears, gave me a hug, and thanked me for listening. She exhaled and she walked back into the RNC free speech circus. Maybe one day she'll hear my story, but today it was my turn to hear hers, and I hope she felt loved. The truth is, our love can hold space for paradox, tension, and disagreement. There's room for all types of beliefs and opinions. Division is a choice. That is a powerful story. When, you, when I first began to read it, those of you who might not have felt similar to her, I imagine it brought something up in you. But then as he began to inquire, he began to see the bigger picture of a human being who was feeling wounded. He didn't try to fix her. He didn't try to make her wrong. He didn't try to make her right. He just compassionately listened. I want to venture to guess that each one of us is here in this room or watching this on Facebook or YouTube because you have chosen to be conscious, because you've chosen to be aware, and because you want to live in a world that is more loving. And so as religious scientists, as practicing the science of mind philosophy, sometimes we have to be with what is in front of us whatever it is, and, and we're not placed there to try to fix it. We're placed there to love it. And when we can choose love over being right, when we can make that decision, well, then it's not just me standing in front of somebody I disagree with. There's a, there's a connection. There's a oneness. There's, there's a a power with that begins to unfold so that whatever needs to happen in me and whatever needs to happen in you begins to happen in a way that is organic to us and integrated so that we can be elevated, so that we can live this world in this world more conscious, more aware, and more loving. So the, the invitation that I have for you today is that I invite you to pay attention to what is in front of you. And then ask yourself, is there something I need to do here? 
Or is this just my opportunity to love and be present? Is this just my opportunity to allow God to hold this person, even if it's just through listening, so that I can be present and give power to circumstance, give truth to circumstances? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so let's, let's do what we do, and that is to speak affirmative prayer. And so I invite you to close your eyes or lower your gaze as I speak this word. That there is a power and a presence that is available to all life. It knows not separation. It only it knows unity. It only knows communion with itself. It is a powerful creation that creates out of itself and gives of itself to all of all life. And so as I speak this word, I speak this word in the first person and I speak this for myself and for you and for anyone who's listening, knowing that that power and that presence is available to me. It is available to me to pause. It is available to me to act. It is available to me to be aware. And so I know that as I move through this week, I use the eyes and the ears and the heart and the mind that I have been given to good purpose so that I can see God in front of me in the playful child or the anguished neighbor and everything in between. For there is deep love in just being present with what is in front of me and allowing it to unfold, knowing that there is a higher purpose, something I may not be aware of. And so I trust and surrender and trust and surrender and then trust and surrender again allowing myself to pause and be clear and to trust that inner voice in what is mine to do. So it is with a grateful heart that I simply anchor this prayer, anchor this spiritual mind treatment in that love from which it came, knowing that this too is God expressing itself and making itself known in this moment. And together we say, and so it is.